Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I actually don't need to introduce this man really, do I? Do I really need to introduce, ladies and gentlemen, Rory Sutherland. I'm going to start by giving you what I think is a very optimistic and accurate view of why print is in many cases vastly more effective than digital. Uh, even though, no, scratch that, because it's more expensive. The only warning I'll give you is I will end on a pessimistic note, which is that in business, people don't take the decisions that are right, they take the decisions that are le least likely to get you fired. And because digital is extremely fashionable, and no one ever got fired for saying, look, I've done something that's cheaper, you will always face that massive obstacle. And I'll talk, maybe if I have a little bit of time, or on the panel, I'll happily talk about that. But um, I described behavioral economics, which is the area of um, dissident economics that I've been involved in uh, for the last six or seven years, as the science of knowing what economists are wrong about. And there's an awful lot, in fact. One of the things you need to understand first is that in order to make ma economics look mathematically neat, so that economists can pretend it's a science. Um, Norman Lamont had a very good joke uh, about the post-Brexit predictions when he said that uh, economists use decimal points in their predictions to prove they have a sense of humor. Genuinely, the ability of economics to predict is very, very weak. Um, and it has a pretty appalling record, if we think back, of both recommending the euro as a brilliant idea, failing to predict the, uh, uh, the financial crisis of 2008, but they achieve the illusion of mathematical certainty through sleight of hand, by, by effectively making some completely bizarre and unreasonable assumptions. And one of those assumptions is that every transaction that people engage in is, takes place in an environment of perfect information and perfect trust. Now, if you think for a little while, that might explain why finance people, who are heavily versed in economics, don't like marketing very much. Because if you had perfect information and perfect trust, you wouldn't need marketing at all. People would know exactly what they wanted, they'd know exactly how much they're prepared to pay for it, and they'd go out and buy it, without a smidgen of doubt in their minds. Now, the good news for marketers although it doesn't help them necessarily win the respect of the finance community, who will tend to see marketing activity as a cost rather than the source of competitive advantage. But the good news for marketers is, one, those conditions of perfect trust and perfect information exist somewhere between very rarely and never. Okay? And the second thing is, even if you could create those conditions, our brains have not evolved to make decisions in that kind of environment. We're not designed to do what economists think we should do. We're designed to make pretty good decisions based on woefully inadequate information, sometimes presented to us by people we don't trust. Now, just as in defense of that, and I'll go on to show you some examples, nature has quite a big advertising budget. Okay? A flower is effectively a weed with a marketing budget. Throughout the world of nature, you see lots and lots of cases where plants signal to bees. For example, they produce a smell, they produce large petals. The bees learn which signals are reliable and which aren't. There are certain smells that bees can produce which are just attractive smells. But there are special smells that, sorry, that flowers produce. There are special smells that flowers produce which you can only produce if you've got a lot of the same kind of chemical which is used to make pollen. And bumblebees prefer that smell because it's a reliable signal. You can't, you know, you can only make that smell if you're a healthy plant able to produce a lot of pollen and therefore it's what you call a reliable signal. And if bees are intelligent enough to effectively detect rules for what is a reliable signal and what isn't, it's not unreasonable to assume that humans have achieved something similar. And this is my point. Um, in biology, there's a wonderful, wonderful uh, theory. Uh, it's by an Israeli um, evolutionary biologist called Amot Zahavi, and it's called costly signaling theory. And I'll tell you a bit about that. But first, 
what I'll tell you about is just um, one of the complicated problems that faces marketers, which is that the human brain, is our behavior is dominated by unconscious instincts and mental processes which are opaque to introspection. Genuinely, most of the time we do something, the major driver of our behavior is not something we fully understand. It's simply something feels right or feels wrong. So the fact that someone doesn't say something, what people say as a reason for doing something is quite often a hastily constructed post-rationalization for motivations that are deep in the, in the gut, as it were, that the people that we ourselves don't understand. Now, I know it's very uncomfortable for us to believe this. Jonathan Haidt, brilliant psychologist, uh, now at the uh, a business school in New York, um, he, his model of the human brain is a bit like a rider on an elephant. And the rider is what you might call our conscious brain, the bit that does the conscious thinking of which we're aware, the bit that does the talking. The elephant is essentially what, what some people would call the adaptive unconscious. It's really important, by the way, to get away from Freudian or ideas that the unconscious is something to be suppressed. Most, you know, I would, I would have died 17 times if it hadn't been for unconscious instincts. Instincts like not going close to that cliff, jumping out of the way of a bus. Most of those really important things to survival are controlled instinctively and unconsciously. And probably we don't really control them at all consciously, any more than we can will our heartbeats to increase, for example, or will our pupils to dilate. And so his point is that the rider essentially lives its life under the delusion that it's controlling the elephant. Now, it can probably nudge the elephant to look in one direction. It can give it a little bit of encouragement. It can, you know, possibly occasionally say, whoa, are you sure you want to do that? But there's a fundamental point here, which is that the rider can't get the elephant to do anything it doesn't want to do. And that's true of human behavior if you look at that sort of dual model of the brain, that conscious reason on its own can't get you to do something that just feels repellent. And there's a strange group of experimental psychologists and just weird people who, who, who do wonderful experiments where they produce very delicious cakes that look like feces. And you know rationally that the only ingredients are kind of sugar, flour, and chocolate, but it's really, really difficult because you've got an extraordinary amount of instinct telling you not to eat anything that looks like that. And so the other point is that and it's a huge problem for marketing because we spend most of our time talking to the rider because the rider can talk and the elephant can't. The rider generates reasons, the elephant just generates emotions. It trumpets a bit, it stamps its feet, uh, you know, it's either reluctant or enthusiastic, but it doesn't really come prepackaged with reasons. And so the problem with market research quite often is you end up talking to the rider, you think what the rider says is an accurate um, uh, representation of the motivation and reasoning behind a decision, and then you end up doing what I'd effectively call as writing software for the wrong operating system. Now, I'll give you, well, I shall, I'll come on to that later. I've got another dual model of the brain, which is a bit, it, it's a tiny bit male centric, but I think everybody in the room will understand it, which is the role of the conscious brain in, in, in the coupled brain is a bit like the role of a man when he buys a sofa with his wife. Okay? Now, you're not totally powerless as a man when you buy a sofa with your wife. Um, you, can, you might be given a casting vote if your wife is completely undecided between two equally attractive sofas. You might be able to exercise some rule of veto. You might just be able to say, you know, over my dead body. Okay? What you undoubtedly know is your wife cares about things in relation to sofas that you don't fully understand. You know, no, that one will look wrong in the corner. Okay? You know, it's one of those strange things. My, my wife has names for colors, which, as far as I can see, don't exist on the visible spectrum. <laughs> okay? But whatever happens in buying a sofa with your wife, you will never, ever end up with a sofa your wife doesn't like. And the, the, the relationship between the unconscious and the conscious brain is pretty similar. You might actually sit down and go, this was the sofa we chose. And it's true to say you were involved peripherally in the decision. Okay? <laughs> 
But to say, you know, to say that you had the, you know, the major role in the choice would be an act of spectacular delusion. And so, you know, the brain, just as men and women care about different things with sofas, I care about largely, does it have flat arms so I can put a laptop down? Okay, where's my wife? It, it, flat screen TVs are the classic case of gender difference in home furnishing. Uh, my wife said, but it will dominate, dominate the room, to which I, well, that's exactly the point. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but, but, but what, what we need to understand is there are very, very large parts of the brain which operate instinctively. And it's not that they're irrational, they're highly adaptive or intelligent, but they have different sort of algorithms and different um, processes to what you might call conscious logical reason. So I'll give you an example of this. It's a very, very successful thing um, the government uh, did, or the last government, as I now have to call them, um, which was establishing a workplace pension where the default is that you're in. And part of that is just because, well, OK, you know, if, if they're giving me this by default, it has to be a kind of OK, doesn't it? You know, you can't sort of impose a default pension on a, on a group of people without checking that it's at least reasonably good. But the more important thing is we're much more comfortable, we're kind of herd species, as far as the elephant's concerned, we're much more comfortable doing things that other people do. You know, we're much more comfortable owning cars that a couple of friends have already bought. We're much more comfortable going to a restaurant if there are already a few people eating there. You've, you've probably had that experience, have you? Where you go into a restaurant, you're kind of led in, and you discover you're the only, you and your wife the, or your husband are the only diners. And you kind of feel, whoa, okay? That's an elephant reaction. Social proof, by contrast, this is the most popular restaurant in X, is instinctively reassuring. So, once you understand this, you understand David Ogilvy's great point, which I think is one of, he worked in market research for Gallup for about eight years, and he said, the problem with market research is that people don't think what they feel, they don't say what they think, and they don't do what they say. <laughs> but apart from that, you might add, um, these are things which I consider beautiful communications because they just somehow talk to the elephant. This is software written for the elephant. This is in a fairly expensive restaurant. I've tried to get a photograph, and I haven't been able to track it down, but it's in saint mille en France. Now, what would every single person do? They put up a sign saying, please turn off your mobile phone. Now, if you're a restaurant, that's a bit bossy, especially if it's written in French. We may react badly, OK? It also is kind of, we're a restaurant and you're the kind of vulgar person uh, who might need to be told. So it's slightly offensive to people, even those who would turn off their mobile phone. What they did is they put the message where it was obviously visible to people leaving the restaurant, but the target audience, that's the ostensible target audience, the real target audience was people entering the restaurant who could also see it. And it's very, very beautiful, because it's a sim simple sentence, but it, it, it does several things. First of all, it's charming, because it looks like a helpful reminder rather than an edict. And we're much happier with that. Secondly, it creates a beautiful norm. It says, well, naturally, the kind of people who dine here are the kind of urbane, civilised people who would always turn off their mobile phone while having a meal. And that's what I call a beautiful act of translation. That's translating rider language into elephant language. It's translate, you know, and I, it's a really, really brilliant case, I think, of just saying, okay, that's what marketing is at its purest, in a sense. Okay, if we were the rider, we'd say this, but the, you know, the elephant won't listen to this argument, just as the elephant in the Brexit vote. You know, the idea that leading economists believe something, okay, you know, it's only convincing, frankly, if you're leading economists. Um, and Pascal, I'm not the first person to say this, Pascal said the heart has reasons of which reason knows nothing. And that's the, the, that's the psychologist's phrase of opaque to introspection. There are things that make us uncomfortable or reassure us where we're not even aware of the effects they have on our mood. Um, I mean, extraordinary experience where people in a shop, if you play French wine, you sell tw play French music, you sell twice as much uh, uh, French wine, if you play German music, sales of German wine go up, and yet most of the people leaving the, leaving the shop haven't even noticed the music consciously. And so this, I will give as an example, as the purest elephant product <coughs> known to existence. Let's say you've gone to a lot of perfectly rational people, a bunch of economists, um, and you'd said, uh, we want to produce a drink that competes with Coca-Cola. You know, for 130 years, Coke has been the world's most successful cold, non-alcoholic drink, other than water. It's about time someone else had a look in. So what do we do to compete with Coke? 
And everybody would sit down in a committee and they'd say, well, it's very, very easy. Um, economics tells us that the answer is completely simple. You produce a drink that's cheaper than Coca-Cola, uh, it tastes nicer than Coca-Cola, and it comes in a really big can, so people get great value for money. And no one would get fired for making that suggestion, would they? No one in an organisation would go, well, that's ridiculous. Come on, come on, you can do better than that. Because it's perfectly rational. And this is a vital problem to remember in all organisations. It is much, much easier. People, most of the effort people make in their jobs is to avoid getting into trouble. It is much, much easier to get fired for being irrational than it is for being unimaginative. So rationality becomes a very, very dangerous, easy path to tread, simply because as long as you can defend your decisions as being consistent with rationality, they may not be very good decisions, but they won't get, get you into any trouble. So there we are, we've got this lovely idea, let's produce a drink that tastes nicer than Coke, costs less than Coke, and comes in a massive can, so we get great value for money. Nope, most successful attempt to compete with Coca-Cola in about 100 years is this. Um, it comes in a tiny can, it costs a fortune, and it tastes disgusting. <laughs> that is basically, that drink is, is pure elephant, okay? The rider has no say in this whatsoever. Now, I think there is something going on. Now, by the way, when I say it tastes disgusting, I'm not being subjective here. I buy the stuff myself. Um, sometimes you know, I'm just too lazy to make a cup of coffee. Um, but um, the, uh, the interesting thing about it is, is that um, they researched it, and they had a, a specialist research company which only researches carbonated cold drinks. And the research company reported back on Red Bull before they launched it, and they simply said, um, we have never seen anything perform worse than this in the whole history of our company. Normally we get comments like, it's not quite my thing, or it's more for kids. Here, the written respondents' reactions were along the lines of, I wouldn't drink this piss if you paid me to. Okay? <laughs> What's going on, I think, that what you might call paralogic or metalogic in, in our instinctive brain simply says that if you want us to believe that something has kind of psychotropic or medicinal powers, it can't taste very nice. That if you want to believe that something's really potent, it's a bit like we think that wheatgrass must be good for us because it tastes so bad, don't we? You know, it's like basically snogging the underside of a flymo. Uh, it's not a great experience to drink, but we kind of think, well, it must be doing something because otherwise why would people drink it? Okay? And in this case, I think... I mean, it's a very interesting thing. One of our clients, S.C. Johnson, has said you can produce fly spray that kills flies and also smells lovely. It smells of lavender. And the interesting thing is you can make it, not difficult scientifically to do, you can't sell it because no one believes in it. If people want to believe that something has medicinal effects, it has to taste a bit rank. I mean, you know, biting into a neurofen, that's about as bad as it gets, isn't it, okay? And something about the unconscious has just, is a learned adaptive idea that things that are medicinal can't taste conventionally nice. If you think about it, coffee, tea, alcohol aren't all that nice to kids. You know, there's something going on there that's kind of interesting and weird. The other thing is to remember is that we don't eat, we, the elephant, to some extent, we don't control what we really see. Now, if I can just switch to the video here, we assume, don't we, that evolution gave us eyes that are like light meters, ears that are like recording equipment, and obviously it's in our evolutionary interest to perceive reality as it really is. W how could it not be, uh, you know, to our evolutionary advantage? Actually, evolution doesn't care about accuracy, it cares about fitness. And the most important thing for fitness is to present information to us in a form that makes sense and allows us to make a decision. And it will happily sacrifice accuracy on the altar of decisiveness. And here, if I just play, if, just play the video until I say, whoa, now, because if, if, if we play the whole thing, it goes on a bit long. Try this. Crank up the ball a bit.
right of the screen. Now to the left of the screen. The illusion occurs because what you are seeing clashes with what you are hearing. In the illusion, um, what we see overrides what we hear. So um, the amount of movements we see as we look at a face can actually influence what we believe we're hearing. If we close our eyes, we actually hear the sound as it is. If we open our eyes, we actually see how the mouth movements can influence what we're hearing. So we can pass on to the next slide now at that point. It's utterly freakish. You all agree? What the brain's doing there, it's a bit like error correction in, in software, in IT. OK, I seem to be seeing far, but I'm hearing bar. It's more likely, I need, I need to be, make a call on this one. It's more likely that I've misheard than I've misseen, so I'm just going to override the B with an F. And it happens deep in our brain, and it's beyond both control and conscious awareness. It just happens. And all of this stuff goes on all the time. Um, wine tastes better if you pour it from a heavier bottle. Uh, wine tastes better if you tell people it's expensive. In fact, in blind tastings, most people prefer the taste of cheap wine. So there you go, just saved you a fortune, hadn't I? Okay? I mean, seriously, you know, if you put relatively cheap wine in a really swanky bottle, Unless the person is a, you know, kind of 1% to 3% real wine guru, they'll be perfectly happy with some reasonable stuff, okay? Um, analgesics are more effective if you tell people they're expensive, they're more effective if they're branded, um, and your car drives better after you've had a car wash, doesn't it? <laughs> and your brain just wants a coherent, consistent view of the world, and it goes, shinier car, better car, therefore, for some mysterious reason, when you drive out of the car wash, your car actually accelerates more nicely, corners better, it's a quieter, smoother car with a better ride than when you drove in. I had a friend who was an engineer who was driven practically insane by this. He thought there had to be an engineering explanation, that maybe the act of buffing the panels tautens the bodywork and reduces vibration. It's entirely psychological. That's why you will never see a car showroom trying to sell cars co covered in mud. Because if you had a test drive in a car covered in mud, you kind of think it was rubbish. Um, and so I don't think it's an enormous stretch if you see what the brain is doing unconsciously to represent reality to us. I don't think it's an enormous stretch to believe and know that when we, uh, when we receive a message, we do not take the message literally. We also factor in the cost, effort, and skill involved in its transmission and creation. We once had a brief, by the way, which was to launch a massively important software product to 200 people. And the account man was very shrewd. He said, what we have to do with this message is convey to them that this is really important. And he said, I'll be absolutely blunt with you. If you can't come up with a good idea, I'll just write a boring letter, but I'll send it by FedEx or UPS. The fact that you spent 15 quid sending the letter by FedEx or UPS kind of says, what the hell's this? No one with something unimportant to say would send it by FedEx. OK? Now, we all understand this instinctively when we get married, okay? The standard wedding invitation, you know, it will be on an expensive card, it will be in an envelope with a handwritten address and a first-class stamp, and it will employ every trick of print, gilt edges, uh, embossing or engraving, that is known to be expensive and difficult to do. And we do that to convey the importance of the wedding. That, you could do exactly the same thing by email. Now, if you received an email that said, hi, would you like to come to my wedding, and underneath the subject line, the wording was exactly the same as the wording on a formal wedding invitation card, okay? It's not the same thing at all, is it? Because unsurprisingly, the brain has evolved not only to care about information in the most literal form, it cares about context, and it makes inferences from the way in which it's transmitted and created which have a bearing on the trustworthiness and significance of the message. And now, you might go to that wedding, mightn't you? I mean, you know, if you're free that weekend, and if you were invited to both those weddings on the same weekend, I'm fairly much betting you'd go to the one with the card, wouldn't you? This one, there's a slight suspicion here of a cash bar, isn't there? Let's be absolutely brutal about that. OK. You know, and we're making inferences like this all the time. And so what I find so interesting about this is we all understand it instinctively when we do it for ourselves. We're instinctive marketers, completely, when we do it for ourselves. Why? Because we don't have to justify it to a boss. 
You know, we don't have anybody when we get married going, well, according to my budget, you know. Now, I worry about this when people say move budget from print to digital, because I think that's true when you are doing something very simple. When you actually have someone who's already convinced and you want to provide them with a channel or vehicle for transaction, I think digital is great. I mean, at the most extreme level, they're so convinced they just Google your product and go and buy it. Okay? In that case, digital is wonderful. If you don't have people who are already convinced and you first have to do some convincing, I would argue that the problem with digital is precisely the fact that it's efficient and inexpensive which is it doesn't therefore convey the seriousness or commitment of the advertiser. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to caveat that for a bit. Um, we, do, we do judge context. So it's not only money. I'm not merely saying the best way to do print is to do the things that are really expensive. That would be silly, OK? If you have no money and you're getting married, and all you can afford for your wedding invitation is literally a photocopier budget, there is a way you can still convey how serious you are about the wedding without spending a lot of money on print, which is creativity. In other words, in order for a message to be significant, it has to be costly, but costly is, does not mean costly only in financial terms. It has to involve resources that are in short supply. And that might be money, it might be imagination, uh, you know, it might be elegance. So if you did genuinely beautiful typography, you know, you spent literally a week of your time, uh, you know, even though you could only afford black and white ordinary print, you just did made it typographically gorgeous, or you made it highly imaginative, um, uh, you know, or you, you know, you, you do something just completely creative and wacky. It doesn't, when I say costly signaling, it doesn't necessarily mean expensive, but something that's clever or unusual or requires imagination or an interesting print technique that no one's seen before. We'll all convey that. Now, we also, by the way, w when we judge these things proportionately, I would argue that my local pub having its Facebook page and updating the menu is quite a good ad for the pub, OK? Because I don't expect the pub to post the menu to me every week. And it requires quite a bit of effort for a pub to bother to do that, because you've got lots of other things to worry about if you're a pub. So I would see the act of a pub updating the menu on Facebook as actually an act of costly signalling. You've actually taken the time to do this when you didn't have to. But if you're a multinational corporation, the rules are slightly different. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. As I said, a flower is just a weed with an advertising budget. To some extent, the bit of the message that conveys the most meaning is the bit that you don't have to do. Do you see what I mean? that to signal convincingly to people the things that we really derive meaning from. Now, a plant could survive perfectly well without doing that. OK? It could just survive, you know, um, it couldn't reproduce so well. But also, one of the reasons it's reliable for bees to actually pay disproportionate attention to this is that a plant that can afford to do this has large resources. Something with large resources is going to produce more pollen. So it is a reliable signal. This is an ad. The peacock's tail is an ad. Now, this is Amot Zahavi's theory of, of handicap theory, which is just simply that peahens reasonably think, well, the tail has no use in survival at all. OK? It's a gratuitous add-on. But it has meaning precisely because it doesn't have any role in survival. And the peahen can reasonably say, well, since you can afford to actually function as a bird, carrying around this decorative burden for purely gratuitous signaling purposes, you must be reasonably fit genetically. Just as you've got to be pretty rich to have a Ferrari in London, because it's a totally inappropriate, unnecessary thing to own in London. Do you know what I mean? If women were merely attracted to men with expensive vehicles, they'd all chase coach drivers, OK? But a coach, a coach doesn't have much signalling status value because it's actually useful. Whereas a two-seater car which will barely go over a speed bump has no luggage capacity whatsoever and probably does about 14 miles to the gallon. That's that. You've got money to burn at that point, OK? And there is a huge amount of advertising in nature. Nature has a massive marketing budget. Things are signaling to each other all over the place. Um, that, you might argue, is an ad as well. It's an engagement ring. Now, the interesting thing about an engagement ring 
is that it is what you might call very similar to an investment because it's upfront expense as proof of long-term commitment. <laughs> now, we have a sense of context. If you're marrying Donald Trump or somebody, you expect a bigger, more expensive ring than if you're getting married as students. But the thing has to be commensurately expensive to the person buying it. You can't, get, you can't make do with a ring pull, okay? And the reason is it's a reliable sign of long-term commitment because you would only buy this thing and give it to someone if you believed in the long-term futurity of the relationship. If you were merely after a one-night stand, there are cheaper alternatives, put it that way, okay? And so it's a reliable commitment device because it's expensive. It's proof of faith in your futurity. I would argue, actually, that the things we find beautiful and lovely in life by the way, there's a really interesting bit of psychology about um, if you're a man, why do women particularly like being given flowers and jewellery by men? And there's a very, very interesting reason, which again is mostly unconscious, why flowers and jewellery are particularly good male-to-female products, which is that men aren't remotely interested in flowers and jewellery. And so there's no suspicion of self-interest in the purchase. If you buy your wife flowers or jewellery, you're patently doing it for her, not for you. Whereas I find if you buy your wife a quad bike for Christmas, <laughs> there's a strong suspicion of self-interest. I, th I think that we are wired genetically, instinctively, to view things that people do that aren't strictly necessary. In other words, things that don't make short-term economic sense is more or less a definition of beauty. This, I think, I'm, I'm always fascinated at what argument someone at Nestle must have had to their finance department over putting that foil lid on the top of this product. It's completely unnecessary, really, isn't it? Okay? But it's precisely because of that 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 product has this kind of magical appeal. You know, what, the interesting thing is it also creates, you've created a canned drink there. Now, you can serve, you can have those cans at your wedding, couldn't you? Whereas you probably wouldn't have, you know, 24 pack of Fanta if you get my drift. Yeah. Now, there are loads and loads of things. You, now, the older people among you, people over sort of 45, will remember buying a cassette deck in the 1980s. And theoretically, what you should have done is read lots of reviews in audiophile publications, found the cassette deck that had the highest quality sound reproduction at the best price, and you would have bought that. Now, you didn't, did you? You pressed the eject button. And if it went hiss with a beautiful hydraulic movement... <laughs> You bought that one, because it was obviously beautiful and gorgeous. And if you pressed eject and it just went clack, that was obviously rubbish, and you weren't going to give it any house room. And in a weird way, it's not totally irrational, by the way, because the effort you put into things that are kind of peripheral is a useful sign of your commitment to what you're doing. Um, I, I, this is one of my favorites. Anybody been to Five Guys here, the burger chain? If you ask for the fries there, you choose small, medium, or large, and they give you a cup that's small, medium, or large, and they fill the cup right up to the top with fries, and then they take an additional scoop, massive great scoop of fries, and put it in the bottom of your bag. Now, that's beautiful because, well, beautiful is probably stretching in this case. It's delightful to the elephant because it's someone giving you something they don't have to. Now, a logical person would make the cups bigger, a finance director would say, stop giving away the free fries. They're costing us money. No, the elephant thinks, wow, this place actually gives me more. You have to fill the cup. You know, you can't ask for a medium fries. They give you a medium cup and fill it two-thirds up. You go, oh, okay? They have to fill the cup. The fact that having done so, they then give you some more is just instinctively automatically appealing to us. And what's so fascinating is you notice that if bees can do this kind of thing, if bees can learn to prefer the signals that are reliable, it doesn't surprise me to believe that over the last two million years, humans have evolved... By the way, there are some plants which have actually worked out the same thing as Ikea, which is if you make the pollen really difficult to get at, OK, bees value it more and they go back to the same species more often. So it's a bit like Ikea, if you think about it. You can't go to Ikea and not buy anything, can you? Because of the pain of the journey. You know, you've driven all that way. You've navigated an insane kind of maze through the store. You've got to buy at least some tea lights. Because going home empty-handed from Ikea would just be unthinkable. And plants have actually invented exactly the same hack with bees. They have a kind of complicated thing they have to navigate in order to get to the pollen. 
if we can just understand the elephant better, I think really great products always have, you know, they're always okay in rational terms. Or actually, Red Bull's an exception, really, isn't it? There's no rational appeal. You can't produce a really great product unless there's some aspect of elephant appeal. If you look at Uber, it's not really about price. I mean, price is good. You know, the way in which they've created a kind of gig economy is economically efficient. They've done some very, very clever software. To the user, the two killers, everybody here, how many people use Uber here? Roughly a few, okay. The real, there are two killer psychological aspects. One of which is the map. The elephant really hates uncertainty, okay. So we'd rather wait 15 minutes for a cab knowing where it is than wait seven minutes for a cab not knowing when the hell thing was going to arrive or worrying about whether it arrived, failed to find our house and driven off again. So the map is a magical thing in just creating psychological value and real happiness. The other thing is you don't have to pay in any physical form. Now, I'm not saying that Uber doesn't do good things in other ways. I would make a claim that if Uber didn't have the map and made you pay cash at the end of the journey and ask for a paper receipt, I don't think Uber would have gone anywhere. I think the real thing that differentiates Uber is a kind of elephant appeal. I mean, it's a very strange thing. If you have a service where the payment for the service feels distant from the consumption of the service, we feel better about it. So, you know, those, anybody here got a Starbucks prepaid card? The interesting thing is when you spend five, five pounds on your Starbucks prepaid card, it feels like three pounds fifty, because the money was kind of already committed, and you know, no money directly changes hands. It's kind of frictionless. And in the same way, Uber feels like a service, not like a transaction, because they don't explicitly ask you for money. You just get to your destination, go, thanks, and get out. The receipt's emailed to you, and the payment's debited automatically. It's a really, really interesting thing. So understanding this, I think, is really important, because I print, in my view, and especially with a young audience. Now, that's going to sound really counterintuitive. Young people, remember, haven't grown up with much print. You know, they don't get much direct mail. When my children get anything through the post, for example, or they give, they're given something tangible, it's magical to them. They've lived their lives bathed in digital free content. So someone who actually sends you a thing, that's the most exciting thing that happens to them all week. So disproportionately, those people who've grown up in a world uh, without remembering how much print you used to get, it has, I would argue, kind of you know, double the power with that new generation. So the thing I always look at is that I would generally say that most marketing, who do we know who to trust? How do we know who to trust? And a very reliable rule for trusting someone is someone who's thinking about the long term rather than something, someone thinking about the short term. Those of you who know about game theory will know that, you know, basically someone who's just out to make a deal and then disappear isn't very trustworthy. Okay? That's why it's really scary buying a second-hand car, by the way. Because, um, and what, what do you mostly do? I mean, it was very interesting. When, when my friends and I were, were buying our first second-hand cars in London back in the mid-90s, we all did the same thing. Without knowing why, we just went back to the small towns where we'd grown up, and we bought a car second-hand from someone vaguely known to our dad. And what we were doing was instinctively very, very clever. It was the thought that... That guy might sell the odd dodgy car, but he isn't going to sell his dodgiest cars to the son of someone who drinks in the same pub as all his customers do. And there are certain cues that someone is trustworthy. We are disproportionately scared of people who are desperate because they, they're immune to reputational damage. People who seem to have long time horizons and be planning for a bigger future than their present are always trustworthy. They're always more trustworthy. So this is an interesting example. It's produced by the biggest brand in the world, okay, Apple. H how many people have got an Apple device of any kind in the room? Just to see, which is pretty much everybody. I mean, two thirds at least. How many people have Apple TV at home? And it's about 15, 20 people. Now, Apple TV is practically the cheapest device Apple sells. It costs 120 pounds. I've got it. It's very, very good. It's a really good product, and it's produced by the world's strongest brand. Why is its penetration so low? And the answer is, they never did any costly signaling. Now, they've ne I've never even seen an ad for Apple TV in Wired or Stuff, okay? 
Um, I've never seen you know, any costly... Equally, when Steve Jobs was alive, he never stood up during a keynote and devoted five minutes to Apple TV. He never mentioned it. And people thought, this is a bit weird. Okay, you've got this product, and yet Apple never spends any money talking about it. You know, it gets reviewed occasionally in the press, but I've never seen an ad, I've never seen a poster, I've never seen a keynote speech mention it. And we can't go, Maybe Apple aren't really that serious about Apple TV. Maybe it's just kind of a hobby. You know, I could buy this product only to find that in two years' time, Apple no longer supports the platform anymore, and I've got kind of Betamax. Because spending money on communication is something you would only do if you believed and intended that your product would be widely and repeatedly popular. Therefore, the act of doing so, because it's costly, signals to the audience that you have faith in the future of your product. Just as an engagement ring, because it's costly, signals that you have faith in the future of a relationship. Now, the interesting thing is we don't think like this consciously very much. I, I hope that most of the people in the room who received an engagement ring didn't go, ah, oh, this is a good bit of costly signaling, which demonstrates through its expense. I think we instinctively understand this a lot. I think it's so important to understand this distinction, we do it automatically. And so, I think... You know, this is my interesting question, that mo a lot of marketing um, is effectively a costly and therefore reliable way. How do you signal that you believe something? Okay? The answer is you spend money. Or you, you do something that's difficult. Maybe you write poetry rather than prose. That's a form of costly signaling. Poetry has more meaning because it's more difficult to write than prose is. Okay? How do you signal you believe that your horse is going to win? Well, you can go around saying, my horse is going to win on Saturday, and everybody goes, yeah, meh, because everybody says that. Bet a thousand pounds on your horse to win. Now I'm interested. Because you would only do that if you really believed it. And spending a scarce resource, which is sometimes money, it's sometimes ingenuity, it's sometimes creativity, it's sometimes just sheer effort, is a really, really reliable way of signalling what you really believe, as distinct from the kind of bullshit we all say. And so, I find this, personally, I find there's something worrying about the way that uh, digital media is cannibalising other forms of communication, because the virtue of the digital media is always efficiency. It conveys the same information at a lower cost, but when you lower the cost, the information isn't the same. Yeah, we, we've all probably been involved with a brief, haven't we, where effectively you had a really, really high budget. And the point about that high budget communication, exactly like the old boss of mine who said, look, if we can't come up with a good idea, we'll just send a letter by FedEx, okay, is exactly that fact. That we don't interpret information literally. We haven't evolved to go, oh, that's very interesting. I've been invited to a wedding in this text message. It's going to be a great wedding. No. Okay? We've evolved to actually interpret information in context, and we don't just look at what the message says. In fact, that may be, in many cases, that's totally irrelevant. What we look at is how much did it cost you to say this, how much would it cost you to be wrong, in the case of betting on a horse. And so, I'm sorry, I'll skip that. Um, but this is very interesting. These are evolutionary um, uh, psychologists here. You know, the low kind of sender... If you have no creativity and no money and no concept of making effort, you can't really become trustworthy. Now, if you look at a lot of middle-class behaviour, you know, uh, you know, dress, you know, wearing suits, doing things that are effectively emblematic of deferred gratification. Would anybody hire somebody who turned up at, at the, uh, for a job interview with a six-pack? No. Right? Okay. Because you know, one of the things you have to signal is that I'm actually playing the long game here. I'm, looking, you know, I'm not looking to turn up and steal all your staplers and disappear. I'm looking to build a career here. Faith in futurity. There are people who argue that most of further education is actually that. It's not really what you learn at university. It's a way of signaling to an employer that you're, you have long-term intentions. If you think about it, you're not going to spend three years at Yale and then get a job at J.P. Morgan and turn up on day one and start photocopying your bum, okay? So it's kind of evidence of your commitment in the same way. And so, effectively, the insight is we find costly signals beautiful. We find print beautiful in a way that digital, unless it's spectacularly ingenious. Now, here's where it gets really crazy, which is that 
Because digital is cheaper, and because most advertisers tend to spend money in on creativity in proportion to the media cost, they commit a double crime, because they go, we've got a lower media cost, so we'll spend less on creating the message. You therefore create a message which didn't cost much effort, didn't cost much money to produce, and didn't co cost much effort, which is almost indistinguishable from a meaningless message. If you think about it, by the way, good manners are nearly always um, slightly costly, aren't they? You know, the things we appreciate in customer service are always things that are slightly difficult to do. The things that you do... The, the guy who's the chief executive of Southwestern Trains is very good on this. He says good customer service effectively is discretionary effort. And discretionary cost and discretionary effort is what actually conveys to the elephant that this is someone with serious intent whom I should trust and listen to. And I think there's one more thing. If you're interested in game theory, essentially what I'm saying is that... Uh, Repeated games. And if, 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 you want, if you want a really bad experience as a customer, go to a tourist restaurant. Actually, that's less true than it was because of TripAdvisor. But it used to be you could have a really terrible meal. If it was a tourist restaurant with a view, that was going to be really awful. Why? They had no prospect of repeat business. The best strategy of a tourist restaurant is basically rip off everybody with food that's as bad as you can get away with, at prices as high as you can get away with, just make sure that they survive long enough to pay the bill. It's essentially the strategy. If you're a local restaurant, you can't survive without repeat business. And so that strategy doesn't pay. And so for a business to signal we're in the long-term game, not the short-term greed game. Now, you've probably noticed something now, all of you in business, which is the shareholder value movement is philosophically contradictory to the business of how you create trust. You, do, you, you create trust by paying for things now that pay back in the long term. The shareholder value movement fetishizes short-term gain over long-term reward and arguably will create businesses that we don't like very much. And so I think um, this is a business. I mean, when I talk about this, th this is a business. When this guy started this business, he in actually engraved on the front of the building the name of the business. That's a guy who's in that business for the long term. You know, now, it's in, nobody does that anymore, do they? They just have a funny little thing. You know, you, 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 you probably have a reception and someone puts little sticky letters up with the name of the company on it. Um, if you look at bank architecture, bank architecture is effectively upfront expense as proof of long-term commitment, which is someone who is planning to skip town with my money wouldn't build a building like this. An enormous amount of life would you, if you think about it, if you'd never heard of the brand before, how readily would you trust a bank branch that was based in a caravan, okay, for making a deposit, okay? Oh, don't worry, here's 5,000 pounds, see you next week. Yeah, right, okay. This basically says, um, you would only do this if you're intending to become a permanent long-term fixture. There's actually advertising in nature, there's advertising in architecture, it's all over the place. If we can just learn to understand the elephant a bit better, we can design better products, better services, and better experiences. Um, the great thing about understanding the elephant is the elephant is slightly irrational. And the great thing about... No, irrational is the wrong word. It's, 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 in evolutionary terms, it's intelligent. It doesn't necessarily seem logical. Most of the Leave uh, movement uh, last week was really emotionally driven. Uh, not entirely to say it's wrong, by the way which is you can have an economic argument about GDP growth, but actually the value of autonomy, okay, which the elephant feels enormously strongly. Actually, one of, the, I mean, one of the strongest things is, if I make mistakes, I want them to be my mistakes, not mistakes that someone else imposes on me. That's quite a strong urge. It's not a bad urge, actually. So the great thing is that if you actually learn to speak a bit of elephant, or you learn to understand the elephant, you will be able to do amazing things that your competitors won't, precisely because your competitors are so bogged down in being rational. They're so bogged down in talking to the rider, and that's what I mean by the pair of binoculars. You know, you have those two things that most businesses rely on, standard economic theory and listening to market research. If you start to understand the elephant, it gives you something a bit like a third eye. You can solve problems in ways that would be impossible using just those two lenses. Um, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll just give you a little example. These things can be really, really small. 
okay? They can be tiny little things. Tiny little sentences can sometimes solve problems. Uh, I was on a plane coming into Gatwick, and one of the most brilliant sentences, most brilliant elephant-friendly sentences was, normally, you know, when you, when you land at an airport and you, there's no air bridge, you have to be bussed to the terminal, you get really pissed off. And in this case, the pilot just said, uh, I've got some bad news and some good news. The bad news is we can't get an air bridge, so you'll have to go by bus. But the good news is the bus will take you straight to passport control, so you won't have to walk far. But what's interesting about that is that's always true. But I've never before seen any upside to going on the bus. Now you gave me a license to actually go, well, actually, given that I've got two bags, I'd almost prefer a bus. So something that had made me angry the previous 15 occasions now made me quite happy. You can sort of synthesize happiness by understanding how the elephant thinks, decides, and feels. But you can also do huge things. Um, if you take the pensions, I would have 40 billion a year, which is a third of the NHS, is spent on pension tax contribution, uh, rebates. So I'll try this little exercise. This is my last little behavioral science thing. How many of you would know, if I gave you 200 quid in cash now and said you can keep that as long as you pay it into your pension before you get home, how many of you would be able to do it? Now, one. That's very interesting. Do you work for Goldman Sachs? <laughs> no, no, I mean, no, no. Funny. You work for the post office. Interesting. Ah. Because the last time I did that, 200 people, nobody knew except one person who worked for Goldman Sachs. So it's now the post office. Excellent. Now, the really interesting thing there, okay, is most of that money, the 40 billion, is sort of wasted because it's compensating for the fact that it's really difficult to pay money into your pension. Because the elephant tends to assume two things. One, it's difficult. I'd have to go home, I'd have to empty a filing cabinet, write a check, find an envelope, post the check, okay? Then I wouldn't even know the money had arrived because I'd have to wait six months until I got my next incomprehensible pension statement, remember that I paid in 200 quid and remember to check. The elephant is never going to do that. You could reduce the tax subsidy by 50% and just make it mandatory for every pension company to have a mobile phone app where you can pop in £100 on impulse and you get a text back saying £100 plus your tax rebate of X has been credited to your pension. The best thing the London Underground did uh, to improve passenger satisfaction per pound spent wasn't faster, more frequent trains. It didn't involve engineering at all. It was dot matrix displays on the platform. We'd rather wait eight minutes for a train uh, knowing it's eight minutes than wait four minutes for a train not knowing when the train's coming. That's pure psychological, that's pure elephant. So that, that, I think, is the vital thing, that behavioral economics, the problem you will always face, and because, expense, because costly signaling is known to biologists and not to businessmen, the problem you'll always face is that these things are difficult to argue for precisely because they're costly. And no one ever got into trouble for doing something cheaper. But sometimes, some businesses are going to learn, actually, the way you do things is by spending money that your competitors don't, and therefore achieving trust that your competitors don't. So print is better, not despite the fact that it's intelligent, it's expensive, it's better because it's expensive. Thanks very much indeed.